Well, hello everyone, a very warm welcome. It is uh, really fantastic to be here and to be part of the alumni conversations. I am really honored and delighted today to be in conversation with Alexandra Clare, who is a graduate of the Center for Global Affairs from 2015. She is also an NYU change maker. We're gonna be talking a lot about um, all the change making that she's been doing both while she was at NYU and, um, and afterwards. Uh, my name is Carolyn Kassan. I am the academic director at the um, NYU Center for Global Affairs, and I oversee our Masters of Science in Global Affairs and our new Masters of Science in Global Security, Conflict, and Cybercrime. And um, yeah, no, I've been at NYU for 17 years, and one of the things that gives me the greatest satisfaction and pleasure is to um, is to reconnect with our alumni and to hear about all the extraordinary things that they are doing. And Alexandra is above and beyond an incredible alum of NYU. And we're so very proud of her for everything that she's been doing. Um, and we're gonna hear her story today. And I'm just really delighted to have the opportunity to be in conversation with you, Alexandra. Um, and just let me very quickly before handing it over to Alexandra with a bunch of questions that I have for her, I want to um, one, very much highlight that she is a change maker and any of you that are listening, if you know anything about the change maker process at NYU, it's incredibly competitive. You can imagine all the alumni that NYU has um, many, incredibly successful, many doing really, really um, incredible work. Um, but Alexandra is a standout. And so she is a 2021 change maker and um, she has every reason to be. She is the um, CEO and co-founder of Recoded, which is an education nonprofit on a mission to empower youth from underserved communities to build careers in technology. And before co-founding Recoded, she launched the first humanitarian innovation accelerator at NYU. And we're going to talk to Alexandra today about Recoded, about the, her experiences at NYU and what she's doing now. So uh, Alexandra, hello. It's wonderful to see you. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. This is, this, is, this is a treat for me, so it's great to reconnect. I know you graduated in 2015, so it's been a few years. It you, has. Uh, you definitely haven't been uh, lazy. You've been doing <laughs> a lot of incredible, incredible work. Um, so let's get started. I am, I'm, I'm, I'm at an advantage here in the, uh, for, for everyone participating because um, I know Alexandra and she was a student at the, uh, at the CGA, but for, for probably many of you joining today, this, this is your first, uh, first time meeting Alexandra. So Alexandra, why don't you just sort of tell us a little bit about what you were doing before you came to NYU and why? Why did you choose to, to come to New York? I know you're not from New York City, but you did choose to, you know, make that big leap and move to New York City and join NYU. So we'd love to get a little bit of that background. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, I was born and raised in Sydney, Australia, um, to a family that I think always really underserved the importance of social justice. And uh, I think, you know, the privilege that we had growing up being able to access a lot of education and the importance of giving back to your community. So that was sort of drilled into me at a very early age. And so throughout, I think, my career, I've always been, that sort of been at the centre point. And it was just a matter of deciding what avenue I really wanted to go down to really fulfil that kind of purpose that I felt, felt driven by. So I studied um, for my undergraduate degree, a dual degree, one in a Bachelor of Law and one in a Bachelor of Development Studies. And then throughout my undergraduate degree, had an opportunity to really go out and also do a lot of hands-on experience um, in the field. So got a lot of human rights experience working in West Africa and also had um, 
uh, a wonderful experience just after I graduated working for a UN court in The Hague, looking at how um, the basically prosecuting war criminals that had um, gone through, uh, how do I phrase this? Um, that were responsible for the war in Yugoslavia in the in the 90s. And I think working there really piqued my interest about how conflict started, um, how it could be stopped, the political ramifications of conflict, and, and also the very human element of, you know, getting to, to um, deal with a lot of witnesses. And so after that experience, I actually went back to Australia and started my career in law. Uh, working at the intersection of criminal law and human rights law. I was a prosecutor in Australia for a couple of years and then um, also doing a lot of human rights work on the side. And, and after a couple of years, I was, I really, I decided that law was not kind of the pathway that I wanted to, to, to continue to pursue. And I knew that I wanted to go on and, and do further studies. And so I had always wanted to live in New York and had this big dream of, of going to NYU. So I started applying for programs, got accepted into to CGA. And it was a really wonderful career tr transition point for me, I think, because I knew that I wanted to pick up a lot of the, the interests that I'd had around conflict and peace building and going deeper into that. And I also wanted to explore what an alternative career pathway would look like and be in a program that enabled me to have the flexibility to test out a lot of different career pathways whilst I was still studying at, at NYU. So moved to New York in 2013 started my master's, which was really wonderful, being able to dive into all these really interesting topics. And at the same time, I basically worked full-time throughout my master's at, at different organizations, really trying to suss out what did I wanna do post-graduation. And I, you know, one of those opportunities was working for the UN, looking at how children and youth were recruited by armed groups, which was really fascinating. Another experience was at Human Rights Watch and another at International Crisis Group. And that gave me a really well-rounded picture of kind of the political advocacy side um, at kind of a, a more international level and also what conflicts were going on and all the mechanisms globally to, to prevent that or persecute people after, after the fact. So uh, that was kind of how it all, all began. And then um, at NYU, I had an opportunity to also take uh, a class uh, on peace building and design a, a program and intervention that I could then go out one summer and, and try to implement. And that was um, the first trip that I did to Iraq, which was kind of the impetus for, for Recoded, the very beginning ideas. Excellent. Thank you. And thank you also. I really appreciated that, you know, kind of going back to your childhood and the foundation that sounds like your parents really set for you in terms of emphasis on social justice and making difference in human rights and understanding right positions of privilege. So, uh, so well done. Uh, kudos to your parents for <laughs> that example. So you come to you come to NYU. You're you're doing peace building. You have an opportunity to go to I think did you go to Erbil in yes. Iraq? Can you tell us about what that what that what that looked like? Um, this would have been was it 2014? Yeah, it was June 2014. June 2014. Um, I was super excited. It was my first trip to the Middle East. And up until that point, um, I had been doing a lot of work studying Africa. So I was kind of unfamiliar with the region. And arrived that summer into Erbil and had the impeccable timing of arriving the same day that ISIS took over Mosul. So it was kind of chaotic on the ground and obviously not at all what I was anticipating. Um, I was meant to, I had designed this very beautiful intervention um, that was going to be implemented by a local NGO there. I was super excited. And then obviously it was, it was just utter chaos on the ground. Millions of people were trying to flee Mosul and get over the border into the Kurdistan region of Iraq. Um, and you also had 
at that stage, the Syrian refugee crisis had been going on for about three years. So you had a lot of temporary refugee camps set up around the city. And so it was really compounding this, this kind of momentous time in Iraq. Um, the economy was collapsing. And so it was, it was pretty hard on the ground. And it was also a really fascinating time to speak to people, to just get to understand like people's stories. I wasn't able to stay that long. I think NYU was a little bit concerned that I was there as a terrorist organization was, you know, taking over and it was still very early days and trying to understand would they come into Erbil, would they get over the border? Um, the situation was really fluid. And so I ended up um, spending a couple of weeks there, getting an opportunity to go around to a lot of the displacement camps, seeing the living conditions that people were in, speaking to a bunch of people before I evacuated. But it kind of sparked the idea, I think, really understanding what interventions were being implemented there, um, what were some of the gaps, and kind of led me into a lot more further research beyond that point. And so I was able to, to sort of take that experience gain a bunch of contacts and then after that trip you know really start doing digging into research what do people want to learn what were the vulnerabilities and I think coming from my experience at the UN where I had basically been looking at a lot of the trigger factors for youth joining armed groups it was a real I was really thinking wow this is a massive security threat you have um, a large one of the largest youth populations across the Middle East um, many of whom are incredibly educated but disenfranchised by the lack of economic opportunities, the lack of options to, to get employment after graduation, or even the lack of ability to get educated if you happen to be a refugee. There was absolutely no higher education programs for refugees. There were, you know, obviously it was in the very early days of people being displaced and they, it was very unclear how people would be able to continue education beyond that point. And um, so really trying to think, what can you do in a situation like that where the economy is collapsing, where people are already feeling marginalised, where they're really wanting a sense of community and also knowing that there was a very real threat that a lot of people would be tempted to um, join a, a radical group like, like ISIS. And so that was kind of where the initial seeds of the idea came from. And then from there, I was able to really go back multiple times um, over the next year and a half as you know doing research trips I was able to do my master's thesis on what would become the the initial idea for recoded and refine that over time through through multiple field trips back and forth um, over different breaks at, at NYU. Excellent. So maybe as a follow up to that, because I, rem I remember, I remember you going, I remember well, 2014, as you, you know, you really described it, right? Such a period of intense volatility and you walked into, you know, Iraq when it was already fragile and the fragility was only, only sort of deepening. Um, so that trip and, and, you know, sort of plant, as you called it planted the seed for what would become recoded. Can you just give us a, a little bit more of the granular details of getting like coming back to New York? You talked about, you know, doing more uh, research trips, but then sort of taking this, you know, idea, building it into a thesis project, but then launching a full fledged, you know, nonprofit. And we'll then talk about what nonprofit is now. Yeah, so one of the, basically I was gathering a lot of data on, on these research trips and what came out of that was I ended up, I think, interviewing between 400 and 500 youth between the ages of 18 to 30 to really understand if they could learn anything, what would they learn um, if given no, if given all the opportunities. And over 90% of them really said, I really want to learn more about technology and I really want to learn English. And I think that was kind of the spark because in the US, it was also a really interesting time kind of having that juxtaposition between being in a place like Erbil, which, 
you know, was going through a very tough time economically, politically um, with the conflict and then being in New York where you have this huge tech sector just booming and all these startups launching and also a lot of alternative education pathways because you had a lot of um, career changes, people wanting to get into tech but not wanting to necessarily go back and do a full computer science degree or engineering degree to transition careers. So you had a lot of these like coding boot camps basically which were upskilling people relatively quickly and enabling them to transition careers so Many for many people who didn't even have university degrees. And I thought that's kind of an interesting idea um, to think about when you know, you're looking at the future opportunities that would exist in the market. Um, the idea that people could work from anywhere um, and not necessarily be reliant on local labor markets, which I think is incredibly important when you are displaced, when you might not necessarily be able to um, work as a refugee because of work permits or restrictions or you know, there may be other systemic barriers in place for you to be able to work. I just love the idea that you could work with just a, a laptop and an internet connection. And I think what I was also simultaneously seeing on the ground in Erbil was that you had a lot of these really large um, humanitarian development organizations that were very well established, but they weren't really innovating when it came to vocational training or a lot of the training programs that they were running. And so they were very gendered, um, like women were all put into sewing classes or all put on into like a beauty school track. Um, and all the men were being put into vocational training sort of um, programs. But, you know, there was no kind of um, analysis of, of global market needs or local market needs and a lack of linkages with employment and kind of future-proofing people, which I think is really important when you look at the, the statistics that most people are displaced on average for 20 plus years, you know, so you really have to think long-term when you're thinking about kind of that transition between education and employment. Um, and so I basically started to think about, I wonder if you could take a, a model uh, like a coding boot camp, which was getting pretty prevalent in a lot of developed contexts and adapt it to a context which was undergoing a lot of conflict and insecurity and see if you could upskill people that couldn't access the local labour market and help upskill them and facilitate that, that next step into employment. So that was kind of the, the underlying assumption and kind of what the my thesis was about. And then it was a whole nother step actually thinking about, okay, well, this is a great idea on paper, but how does this actually um, become something in practice? Like, how do you implement this? Do you start an organization? Is it a project? And personally, I was also really conflicted. I had a job offer coming out of NYU to move to Geneva and work as a sort of in humanitarian diplomacy for the International Red Cross, which was kind of my dream job pre deep diving into all of all of this research. You know, it had kind of been the thing that I had been working towards my whole career. And I felt really conflicted. Do I take the risk and turn down the job offer and start something which, you know, has never been tested before. No idea how to run an organization. I had never thought I really want to be an entrepreneur and, and start this. Um, or do I go the, the safer route and the more traditional thing that I had been sort of working towards? And so it was really at that crossroads and trying to figure out, do I stay in New York? Do I move to Switzerland? What do I, what do, I do? Wow. So it brings me back. I remember when I was at this pivot point and um, a wise woman said to me, growth is the temporary abandonment of security. So I did, you know, I took a different path and it sounds like, you know, you, but also you would the path you took much more impactful, but um, I'm just curious though, from the point of this ideation, you have this idea for recoded. I'm, you've also, you know, presented a picture of, you know, a lot of large NGOs that are working on the ground that have been there for, for many years that are, 
you know, maybe working within kind of the, the, the space of the status quo with regards how they approach education. You know, how did you break through? I mean, how did you, I'm just thinking of the, you're, go, you're working with internally displaced people, you're working with refugees. How did you break in to being able to offer them a program such as Recoded? Yeah, I think that was one of the toughest parts of, of starting the pilot. It's really trying to convince people to give you a, a chance, both the people that you're trying to serve, but also everybody else who is sort of, it's, I think it's a sector that doesn't really like to experiment that much, that is very risk averse and for good reasons. You know, you don't want to do harm to people as well. So um it was it was really really challenging it was very challenging to get funding for the idea to convince someone to like take a risk on me I had never started anything before I had you know absolutely never implemented anything in Iraq working with really vulnerable people and to be really honest like we made every single mistake under the sun during that the first year that we actually went from this is what it looks like as a project on paper to let's actually try and move to Iraq, run a selection process, um, choose people for this program, take people through, through a program. Um, it was very, very different in person than, than, you know, all the assumptions that we had made when I was sitting in New York writing this up as a master's thesis. But I think it's, it's so critical to go through that steep learning curve because without it, how do you ever iterate and get better and really understand what will work if you aren't able to make all those mistakes at the beginning? And so it was, it was an interesting, it was a hard time. Um, we ended up convincing, um, so I guess backtrack a little bit. What ended up happening is I was able to convince someone at the UN to, to fund the pilot idea. But again, like it wasn't an organization. So they were like, who would we be giving the funding to? And because I had developed this at, at NYU as part of my master's thesis, um, CGA came on board and said, look, we'll incubate the idea at, at um, CGA. The UN can fund it through, you know, the university or, and we'll, we can go ahead with the pilot. And so that's sort of how institutionally it all happened. And then on the ground, it was just a lot of sitting down with people and really trying to explain the idea, um, having a lot of tea <laughs> with people. And, and, you know, some people were not willing to, to take a chance and some people were really open to it. And so that's sort of how we were able to, to kick off the pilot. And I think, you know, we have evolved so much since the early days of, um, of that pilot as well. It's, it's funny, I think every year it becomes a different organization because you're just going through so many different growth points. And it has been a, a massive learning curve really going from that initial pilot to where Recoded is today. We're, you know, a nonprofit with 50 employees working across multiple countries, serving, you know, hundreds of people a year, thousands of people a year. And so it's very different than it was um, at the beginning. And you're doing a different job every day, you know, so you're having to constantly grow and, and change as you as you go through the process as well. Yeah, very much the entrepreneurial startup story, right? In terms of you, yeah, you fail, but you get back up, you keep going and um, you, you iterate, you innovate as you're, as you're building. It's, it's really is, it's an inspiring story. From your initial population of students that you worked with to where you are now, can you give us, you know, can you tell us about, you know, where you are today in terms of the, the programmatic picture and the different countries you're working in, but also what that initial cohort looked like and what did they, what did they go on to do as a result of participating in the recoded program? 
For sure, yeah. So I think one of the assumptions that we made, which turned out not to be true, is that absolutely anyone can learn how to code, even if they don't understand what being a software developer is. So we basically chose 40 people, um, all of whom were either internally displaced from Mosul or Fallujah or had been displaced from Syria for that initial cohort of students. We didn't have a kind of a very rigorous selection process at that stage. So we had a real mix of diverse backgrounds. We had teachers, we had people that were former engineers, we had people that had been working in the NGO sector. It was, it really ran the gamut of, of backgrounds um, and also geographic locations where they were from in Iraq. Um, and we took them, that initial pilot was a 10 month program mostly our, our population of students, the 40 initial students, didn't speak English. So our first step was, okay, we have to teach them English. So that was the first two months was like teaching everybody the basics of English because our curriculum was also coming from a coding school in New York, all of whose curricula was, was completely in English. Um, and, and then starting the coding boot camp. And we were also thinking they should learn how to be full stack developers. So front end and back end. And we'll teach them in this really intense, like six to eight month period, um, basically using the exact model that the boot camp in, in New York does. Um, so I think what, what turned out to be true is that not a, I think a lot of people realize throughout that journey that actually I don't really want to become a software developer. Um, but the great thing about that program was that we were able to teach them a lot of other skills. So we taught them a lot of soft skills, a lot of business skills. And so a lot like I'm still in touch with a lot of the alumni from our pilot program, I think because I was so involved in, in all of their lives. Um, seeing them absolutely every day, sitting down with them, doing a lot of the teaching myself, that, you know, it is really extraordinary to see how far they've come. Some of them have started businesses. Some of them have are working in NGOs and working their way up. Some of them are software developers, not all of them. I think today one of the things that we really validate in our, um, in our selection process and what has changed dramatically from that first pilot is, you know, we realized that one of the most critical things is that someone really knows that they want to become a software developer. That's actually the most critical thing that we, we select for. So when we go through a selection process today, we're not looking for previous employment like background or educational background. It's that someone knows that this is the career pathway that they want to, to go down and that they have the perseverance and grit to go through a program like Recoded. The actual program structure has also changed dramatically. So, you know, pilot phase, we were six days a week, full time, nine to five in a small classroom. Today, most of the, um, you know, we use a flipped classroom approach. So, you know, most of the, the program is, is actually self-taught. So students going through curricula on their own and then coming to class three days online with our instructional team. And it's all project-based work. So it's all working with their peers, building things, um, learning together in that kind of online environment, and then applying that knowledge in a final capstone project so that they're graduating from, from the boot camp with you know, a really tangible project, which can also either go on and, and launch a, a business solving a, a problem in their local community, or at least like something on their portfolio, which helps them land their, their first job out of the boot camp. So today we're running um, a mix of a mix of programs. We're operating across four countries at the moment in, in the Middle East. We operate across Iraq, Yemen, Turkey, and Lebanon, and we're just about to launch in Jordan as well. Um, and we offer coding boot camps in a range of different technical subjects and UX UI, so product design as well. 
Um, and then we've also started to get into more entry-level programs as well. So not just the career-focused programs, but for people who are, you know, just testing the waters, seeing maybe this is the path for me, maybe they don't have the language skills, making those programs a lot more accessible, also in Arabic, because all of the career-focused boot camps that we do are still today all in, all in English, because a lot of our students are working remotely for, for companies all around the world, which is, is really exciting. Amazing. So I'd love to hear more about the companies that students go on to work for, but also if you could share with us your partnerships, right? This is, I think this is a nonprofit, you know, your students are not paying tuition. Where do you get the support to, to run the programs? How did you, you know, how did you um, build those partnerships? And I'm also curious, I mean, these are, you know, the four countries that you identified are not easy countries to work in um do you have do you feel like you have the support of the government or how do you manage that that relationship with the government yeah for sure so we most of our funding to date is is coming from government funding so we work primarily with um the u.s government and the german governments for kind of the institutional bulk of the funding that the organization gets um, it has been really a, um, a team by team approach, I think, gathering that funding, launching in new countries, really understanding the priorities of, of different funders. Um, I think one thing that, that kind of makes Recoded different is that, you know, we, we're one of the few organizations that really does what we do in the region that we're working in. And it's such a growing sector. I think, you know, what was really interesting during COVID at the very beginning, we were like, we have no idea how this is going to impact job prospects for our students, this crisis. And what we've seen is nearly 100% employment coming out of our programs because actually the tech sector is one of the few sectors that has, you know, really continued to grow throughout COVID and remote work has become so normal that it's actually increasing the, the employment options for our students post-graduation. Um, and what is really interesting to see also is the data points of what happens like one year post-graduation, two year post-graduation, that career progression and growth for students. We're seeing them, you know, get poached by different companies now or, you know, being able to go and say, oh, my company's got five open roles. Can you fill them um, with more recoded alumni? So you really start to kind of build up the momentum in terms of the employment outcomes as well as you go on. We're also lucky to get funding from a lot of tech companies that also um, support us in different ways. So one of the partnerships that we launched um, last year was with Bloomberg. Um, who, massive global company, 19,000 people, but also a lot of people that were really like in the midst of this pandemic, they really wanted to, you know, give back remotely. And so we now have a huge mentorship program where their engineers, their designers, as well as a lot of their managers and HR professionals are mentoring and coaching all of our students, helping to prep them for employment, which is super exciting because it's that wonderful linkage between what does industry actually look like um, in practice and getting someone who's, you know, had to apply for a job and who can really coach the people in their, their first steps and help navigate those, those roles. And um, also, I think just like giving visibility to a lot of our students who um, are absolutely extraordinary, but have, you know, many of them are, are going through really difficult, challenging um, personal circumstances. Um, in terms of your second question, how do we work with governments? We don't actually work that closely with governments because we are kind of a finishing program to higher education, we would say. So one of the reasons why Recoded started was, was because across the Middle East, you have this problem where higher education isn't necessarily preparing youth for the labour market. So you have this big gap skills mis mismatch, I would say, which is why it has the highest youth unemployment rate in the world. And so, um, you know, what we usually say is that we're, we're either a finishing program for people that have a computer science degree, but none of the actual practical skills to be able to get, get a job will help them get those practical skills and help them land their first job. 
um, or we are an alternative to higher education. So people that lack access completely because they've been displaced and can't get into the, the local higher education system. It's, it's a wonderful replacement for them to get skilled and get skilled in a job that really enables them to professionally progress over the long term, earn a decent income, and then be able to, um, you know, support their families, which is, is super important. Um, we have just launched this year a pilot program where we're actually working with educators. So this is kind of an interesting um, transition point. So one of the big questions was how do we amplify our impact at Recoded without necessarily like expanding to thousands of countries? And one of the ways that we decided to do that was really taking a systemic approach. So really understanding, okay, one of the root causes of why there is such youth high youth unemployment rates is because of the quality of, of higher education. What if we were able to target educators to improve the way that they teach, um, give them the latest pedagogical knowledge, the latest skills, the latest tools and techniques that we've been learning about over the last couple of years, implementing online programs, using flipped classrooms and blended learning methodologies and, and translate that into higher education at large in, in the Middle East. So we're just taking our first cohort through a fellowship where it's similar to our boot camps, but targeted specifically towards higher education um, professionals that have been teaching for a couple of years, vocational trainers that may be great technically, but don't have the teaching skills to really um, upskill youth populations. And what we've seen so far is that for every educator that we teach, on average, they're teaching about 100 youth per year. Um, so you could really start to see the multiplier effect that you could have over time with with a program like that, which is really exciting. But again, we're not really working directly with the government. It's more educators um, as individuals. Love that. That's fantastic. I didn't know that you had moved into that area, but so important as you described, right? And the impact, right? When you say, you know, one teacher to 100 students, that, you know, that's just, just so important. It's really incredible. Can you, and for, those out there, please do send your questions in. Um, I will, I can very happily ask, continue to ask Alexandra lots of questions, but <laughs> I am sure that there are some questions that, that those of you uh, joining us today might have. So please do send them in. Um, so in 2019, um, Alexandra and Recoded was highlighted in Vogue. Um, and the title of the piece was how, how Alexandra Clare is using tech to empower war affected teens. It was an incredible piece. It was a really wonderful interview. Um, I am curious also how you work with girls, girls and young women, because again, some of these countries don't have the, um, the best records of, um, of, uh, female equality and opportunities for women. So I'd love to just get a better sense in terms of how you've addressed that within Recoded and what that has meant for the, um, for the women that you've, uh, you've worked with. Yeah, so we've worked with, I would say one of our underlying mission, um, mission goals that we have at Recoded is, is also bridging the gender divide in technology. So we really are quite active when it comes to making sure that we're selecting um, really powerful women to go through our programs and then helping them, you know, showing that there is strong role models, that this is a tangible career pathway and helping them get jobs. So to date, I think we have about 45% of women that have gone through our immersive programs are female. And from the very outset, we really create um, an environment where they're set up to succeed, where the expectations are set that absolutely everybody is equal and that there is um, equal opportunity in terms of learning, but also that we're going to help prioritize um, great employment outcomes for them. And then we've also piloted um, a couple of all-female programs. So last year in Iraq, we started to run some programs in 
communities that had been heavily impacted by ISIS. So it was a, sort of a combination of um, design programs with a lot of psychosocial support for women that had experienced huge amounts of trauma. And that was also really powerful, really creating these safe spaces where they were learn learning a tangible skill that could transition them into different career pathways, um, but also getting women in a community to come together and really talk about their experiences, having that space, safe space and that that support from mental health professionals to enable them to kind of move forward in, in their lives. Um, and then, yeah, so I would say those are the two main kind of programmatic things that we, we have done. But I think part of it is, um, you know, being active in, in the voices that we highlight and being able to show that this is a, a viable career pathway and, and taking a pretty individual approach to all of our students. Because I think, you know, across the board, there's imposter syndrome for both men and women. Um, and I think making sure that there is these safe spaces in the classroom for people to be able to vocalise that and, and talk about it and how does that impact your career choices. And I think one of the very interesting things that we've actually seen is that by running the programs online, they're a lot more accessible to women. So this was, you know, it was always a challenge for us because we were usually running classes in the evenings. Um, we're having to think about like the actual logistics of doing that. So, you know, program managers were pre-COVID going out and speaking to a lot of females' families or the females' families were coming to interviews so that we could reassure them that this was a safe learning environment, that they would be taken care of, that we were going to take care of the actual logistics of coming to and fro from, from class. And being online has just made it a lot more accessible to women there is no longer a commute so it means we can you know um, retain them so we've had higher retention from women and not just women I also think like people with disabilities it kind of makes the programs a lot more accessible by by having it online and also people that are not living in in city centers we were really constrained by the fact that it was we had physical training hubs in certain cities. Now we're opening up to a whole country. So we launch programs in Iraq where it's, you know, people from nine different cities participating, um, many of whom would never have had the opportunity to come to Erbil or come to Baghdad for, for a program previously, but can easily learn online and get a job online. So that's been also really impactful. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that. We have, a, we have a couple of questions, and this is kind of a nice, a good question based on what you just shared. Um, and thank you, Pia, for your question. Um, I was wondering, have you been able to see any tangible impacts on how higher education impacts security threats? Youth joining terrorist organizations, has this come up in any conversation with students? Thank you, Pia, for this question. Yeah, it's a, it's a really wonderful question. I would say, um, you know, there is not like a lot of data um, on this that we've been collecting as an as an organization. Um, but anecdotally, I would say, you know, the higher education um, or the higher access to opportunities to have, the less likely that you are to um, to feel like you should you're seeking out a sense of alternative purpose or community. So one of the things that we've been pretty intentional about at Recoded is really creating that sense of community um, with students and making sure that they have that sense of purpose and that it is really career driven because I think it is important. Um, but there is not like a lot of data to say that absolutely everybody that is highly educated or that has a job prospect will not join a terrorist organization. And um, yeah, I think it, it really comes down to, to individuals. Great, but I, I think as you pointed out, right, you noted earlier in the conversation how that was, you know, almost a driver for you when you first got- Absolutely. Out, in terms of seeing, you know, seeing ISIS, um, taking over, recognizing young people, high, high rates of unemployment, that, you know, opportunity structures, if they're not in place, it's easier to, you know, to go down a different path, whereas if those Absolutely. structures are there. So, yeah, really important. So this is a, uh, this is a great question that's also come in. Is there any advice you would give a younger Alexandra or someone aspiring to take on a career like yours a few years down the line? 
I would say if you're if you're between the traditional path and the less traditional path and you're in a position where you're able to take the risk, um, you should definitely go for it because you have absolutely nothing to lose. Um, I think also, you know, I started this pretty naively, not really understanding like what it would actually be like to, to run a company, be an entrepreneur, and it is really challenging. And so I think you know, just saying persevere, um, don't give up when the going gets tough. I think there are so many ebbs and flows in in life and in work. And I think the most important thing to trying to see the impact and success is to just keep going. Um, so I think that would those would be my my two main main pathways. And I'm also cognizant that taking these sorts of risks are also a privilege. Like it's not always easy. Some people um, are not able to start the entrepreneurial pathway. And I almost wish that I had de-risked it a little bit for myself because you know my thinking was, well. I'm already broke, so I've got nothing to lose. But at the same time, I didn't necessarily have anything to fund myself in the early days when I wasn't getting paid. So I think it, you have to be sort of practical about it if you're going to go down an entrepreneurial pathway. Think about do you have like six months of savings that you could survive on if you're you're going to do it? And that's it's very real for a lot of people. Um, but, yeah, otherwise I would say take the risk. Great. Love that. Great advice. And I think many entrepreneurs would, would, would echo what you said, right? There, you kind of go into this unknown, the unknowns, right? You hope, yeah. um, but if you had known the unknowns before taking the path, right? <laughs> um, Maybe been a little bit different, but it's uh, again, kind of being open to that, uh, being open to the challenges, right? And being, I think one of the things that you said in your in the Vogue interview was that, you know, you weren't afraid to fail. And you noted early on that, you know, the first year was really hard, right? There were some mistakes that were made along the way, but that you didn't let those mistakes stop you. You persevered through them. So the grit is very important. Um, <laughs> yeah. So um, another question, I was wondering for a career in the education field, what are some other opportunities that you recommend taking advantage of at the CGA, right? So here we go, back to the CGA. So this is a question, another question from Pia. I wish, Pia, that I had um, I had done more classes on, on education, but what I would, um, <laughs> so most of my classes at CGA were very much in like conflict analysis or peace building and um, I should have probably taken a couple more practical classes on you know non-profit finance or um, whatever other practical skills I could have gotten before starting um, but I would say one of the wonderful things about CGA is just being able to to take a diversity of classes um, not just at CGA but if you're doing a degree at CGA you also have the opportunity to do classes in different departments across NYU and I think that can be hugely valuable if you want to get diversity of, of experience um, you know combining that really wonderful subject matter expertise with a lot of great um, professors or adjuncts that can kind of go deep on on that you know whether it, it is cybersecurity or you know um, conflict analysis or something like that and then combining it with the more generalist ones from either CGA or or other schools across NYU. Excellent wonderful and uh, Pia feel free to reach out to me as well I'm happy to uh, sit down and chat with you. So we asked you about um, sort of the younger Alexandra and advice. What about the next five years, the next five to 10 years? What do you, what's, what's your vision for Recoded? Where do you see you, you know, you've already said that you're going to be moving into Jordan. You're now working with educators, you know, you're, you're, you're making some really significant, um, um, additions, to to what you're doing at Recoded, love to get a sense in terms of if you could give us that picture for the next five to ten years. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think it's a really exciting time for the organization because we've put in place a lot of those foundational building blocks 
for us to really scale our impact. And so that will be the big focus for the coming years. I think expanding geographically um, to other countries across the Middle East, but also I think uh, potentially in the next, you know, that five to 10 year window outside of the Middle East, thinking about other regions where we could really have an impact um, on students. And I think my vision is that we become sort of a, a reference point when it comes to upskilling marginalized youth that lack those, those tangible um, opportunities and really connecting the dots between um, you know, what it comes to the future of work. So what are the skills that people need to really thrive in, in this environment, whether that be technical skills or thinking about the soft skills and people being able to constantly adapt and reskill and learning how to learn and, and prepare themselves so that they can launch these really meaningful careers. Because I think it plays such a huge part in people's sense of self-worth their ability to, to support their families and gives them that stability that I think having a job can, can be that really wonderful launch point for a lot of people. Excellent. So we have another great question, which actually is a question that I had meant to ask you. So Jenny, thank you so much for, for asking this question. Regarding the infrastructural challenges, especially in remote communities, how have you addressed or work around the connectivity issue for those who do not have internet access and can't make it to a hub for in-person training? Yeah, for sure. So this is, it's always a logistical challenge, but one of the, the ways that we've addressed this in our immersive programs is we offer data scholarships and laptop loan programs. So for anyone that lacks the hardware, we'll send them a laptop um, in the mail so that they can log on to all the classes and, and basically provide them with um, like a scratch code to say, here's your data credit for the month. So they have internet access. And it's just a matter of coordinating what is the strongest provider depending on where you live across the country. And with the team has been really amazing at kind of innovating around this, like thinking through how do we have these connections with so many different internet service providers and, and give students the autonomy of choice to be able to find the best provider for them and, and get connected. But it is still a challenge. Like we, as I said, we're working in Lebanon. Lebanon is, is particularly challenging for this at the moment. People really have access to only about an hour a day of, of government electricity so you can imagine the the challenges there and a lot of people are, are basically connecting through their phone data to be able to um get get connected and join classes and i think what is extraordinary is is people's perseverance in situations like this like we have almost 100 percent retention in our programs in lebanon um, and really high employment outcomes which i just find extraordinary when you have um, such challenging circumstances um, in across the country but we're working in in tripoli which is a particularly i think vulnerable area in in lebanon Wow. Yeah, no, inc incredible, right? And the way that, again, kind of going into the more granular idea of these partnerships that you've created as you, you know, as you highlighted with internet providers and making sure that, you know, you find those access points in very, very challenging environments where, um, but yet you're doing it, right? And I think yeah. that, that um, stat that you just shared about 100% you know, participation and attendance is just, is so fantastic. So fantastic. So any, any, anything else that you'd like to share? Any final thoughts, any advice? I actually shared some great advice for, for Pia in, in terms of thinking about education and what to do at the CGA, but as a, you know, as a, a you know, a rock star entrepreneur, a, um, a really impactful nonprofit, is there something that you see a kind of a space that, that, that there's a real need that, you know, maybe someone joining us today, either they have some, they have an opportunity to help support or they themselves might, might get involved. Yeah. I just think doing your, your master's is such a wonderful um, period in your, in your sort of career where you can take a step back and, really explore what does that next step look like for you. I think it's a time of growth and learning and 
I would really encourage people to to really dive into that and encourage them to think about like what are, what problems are you passionate about solving because I think that's kind of the heart of of starting anything right it is it is going to be tough and so you want to make sure that whatever you're building is something that is really meaningful to you um, and I think doing a program enables you to just gives you that space to step away from maybe another career or the opportunity to go down different pathways with different courses and really explore your curiosities. And I think it's a you're at a, a later stage probably of your career than you were at undergrad where you know just a little bit more about yourself and what you want your future to look like. And so I think just get curious and, um, yeah, dive into problems because that's usually where the most creative ideas come up and whether I think it's such an exciting time to be launching a career. It's such a period of change for, you know, in the education space, um, in the technology space, you know, there is so many different geopolitical stuff going on that there's a lot of problems and exciting things to dig your your teeth into and a lot of solutions that don't exist yet so I think it's a really exciting time to be to be launching a career and diving into this whether it's building something yourself or joining another startup or um, another organization where you can help someone else build something I think it's great Beautiful, and I love the the emphasis on curiosity. I always uh, tell students when they're starting the program is to be open, open to surprise, right? That you know, oh, completely. That the pathway that you think you are going to go on may may shift, and you're a beautiful example. Yeah. Of that. So, really quite incredible. I want to extend my sincere thanks and gratitude to you for, and your team, the whole team at Recoded, because you are just doing really, really incredible, important work. You're, you're changing lives. You're, you know, you're, you're building out opportunities and you're, you're meeting them where they're at. And that's um, just it's really is an incredible story and it's been um, a pleasure to spend the last hour with you. Um, I'm a, a big fan of yours, as you know, I've totally shared with you on other <laughs> occasions, but I really, um, to see how it's, you know, recoded started as a seed here at the CGA and now what you've built and what you are, you know, expanding. Um, it's just, it's, it's really fantastic. And NYU is very, very lucky to have, to have you as a, as an, an alum and to be the 2021 uh, change maker, alumni change maker. So it's, uh, it's a really well-deserved recognition um, for your accomplishments and for the work that you do and will, will continue to do. So really, really grateful. Thank you so much for having me. It's been such a pleasure to chat and um, also get all these really great questions. Yeah, and thank you to everyone who um, who joined today. Uh, I was really wish I could see your faces, but you know we're all uh, we're all here together, and uh, definitely be on the lookout for. I think there's an exciting um, bunch of events that are going to be happening during um, Alumni Week, so be on the lookout for that and. Um, yeah, everyone, please do take care. And again, many thanks to Alexandra for her time and her work. Thank you. Thanks.